So how exciting and encouraging. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. And how great to hear. I want to go to work for the Rosen Hotels. How about you? I mean, what a great plan. That was wonderful. And thank you for that uh, wonderful description of Sidera's work. The, that's the kind of creative solution that can only come from people who are trying to solve problems. And, and thank heavens for the repeal of the individual mandate, which allows this kind of arrangement to really begin to flourish. So thank you for, for sponsoring this wonderful dinner, and particularly thank you for what you're doing, doing here. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a of a sense of the larger environment that we're working in, and obviously some decisions are going to be made on Tuesday that will have a decisive impact on the options ahead. But I um, will talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the larger policy environment. And if we have a few minutes, I think we're going to be running until 7.30. If we have time, we'll, we'll do a few questions. So this is actually the sixth year of annual enrollment just started yesterday in the Affordable Care Act. And if you'll recall, this time uh, in 2013, all the news was about the website not working. Well, the website's now working. But as this, as this law has moved forward, I actually was on the, on, in the balcony of the House floor uh, of the House chambers when the law actually passed in 2010 in the House of Representatives. And speaker after speaker were assuring us that this was the final piece of the puzzle to get to universal coverage in the United States. And so we still have 28 million people uninsured. Nothing has happened to control costs, and in fact, they've gone the opposite direction. So it is clear that we still have a lot of work to do. What's happened with the Affordable Care Act is it's really become a health insurance plan that's as, for as a last resort for people in the individual and small group market. And because the um, individual mandate has gone away, there are now other, other options. But the people in those plans who are getting Large, in, most, in most cases, relatively significant subsidies, both for their premiums and for their cost-sharing adjustments, are finding that the networks are getting narrower and narrower, that they have, in some cases, no opportunity to get care outside of the network. The premiums have leveled a bit this year, but that's primarily because insurance companies have figured out how to drain even more money from the federal ta treasury to be able to make those premiums affordable. And, and it really become a kind of a high-risk pool. Most of the people in the plans are, are, are sicker than people in the open market. And one of the things this administration has done is try to give people more options. After the individual mandate was repealed as part of the Tax Act earlier this year, the, the mandate's not repealed, the penalty for not purchasing health insurance is repealed, and we can talk about why the complexity of that, the legislative hoops you have to go through. Uh, but nonetheless, de facto, the individual mandate is gone, and it gives people more options. So the, the administration has come up with three new options for people, and I think Jim Parker may have talked with, the, talked with you a bit about them at lunch, but they're important because they give people more choices. Short-term, limited-duration plans. These are, this is a terrible name, but a, that's unfortunately a legal term that um, they have to use. This is, this is basically what we would call bridge coverage. You retire early, you're not yet eligible for Medicare, and you don't have employer coverage any longer. You're starting a small business, and you need coverage, you need to protect your family while you get, get the business on its feet. You're between jobs. Those plans under the Obama administration were reduced to only three months. You can only buy one short-term limited duration plan only for three months. And the Trump administration said, you know, we need to give people more options than that. So they pr proposed a rule that allows people to purchase those plans for a year and to renew them for up to three years. So that's an option for, they estimate, maybe two million people. These do not have to be ACA compliant policies, so people have more choices of the kind of policies. People call them skimpy plans, but for a lot of people, it's either this or no insurance. So this is one, one option for people. Another is the association health plans. 
they've been talking about this forever in Washington, why can't people join together in groups other than employer groups to be able to purchase plans? And association health plans allow people to get some of the economies of scale for health insurance that large employers do, but for individuals and small businesses. And I just read today that Land of Lakes, you see Land of Lakes butter and cream in your grocery stores, Land of Lakes is starting an association health plan for dairy farmers. And so they'll be able to, instead of having to buy individual policies, be able to aggregate with other dairy farmers to be able to purchase health insurance. And they also are allowing something called health reimbursement arrangements to be more flexible. These are about 15 years old. They sort of look like a health savings account, but it's only in the employer market, so that employers can give employees a larger umbrella policy, but to, to give, to fund an account so they could get care on their own. I think that the, the right way for people to get care is a kind of wonderful coordinated care with a physician who's looking out for you that direct primary care offers. Unfortunately, because of the IRS rules, that's not something, and I know that Dr. Gross has been a, really a part of, of this initiative and many others, and, and Dr. Mike also, to make this happen, Dr. Schurz, to, to give people more options to get, to get coverage in the small, mostly the small employer, I think, community, individuals and small businesses, can put money, in, if your employer said, I can't deal with all the hassles of providing an insurance plan to my employee, but I can give that, month, that, that employee the money that I otherwise would have spent on health insurance for them and give them that money in the, with the same tax advantages they would get if, I, if the employer purchased the plan so that they can, for example, purchase a plan in, um, in one of the, with, through an association health plan or pool their money with their spouse's money to buy a family plan for one of, the, one of the working spouses instead of individual coverage for both of them and then they have to buy a separate policy for the kids. So there are all sorts of things that are, that are coming along to give people more choices and more options. And I think that's really how we need to look at the health sector in America. There are a lot of people, and I think we're going to start to see this debate as soon as the elections are over on Tuesday, the 2020 presidential campaigns will begin. By this time next year, we already will have had several presidential primary debates. That's how soon this is. And there are 128 members of the House of Representatives who signed on to a Medicare for All bill. It's hard for me to see how that's going to sell. It's going to be very interesting to watch this debate. As I, I run a think tank, the Galen Institute, named after the second century Greek physician, that um, we, we, we are in, operating in this space, in Washington and in the states, in trying to influence legislative and, and, and government decisions toward more patient control, more individual control, more free market options. And, and Medicare for all, it just, I mean, you've got 175 million people with employer-based coverage who would lose it under an employer-based plan. The Rosen Hotels would not be able to do this kind of health and health model that they've done because they would want everybody to be in, under the same umbrella. Everybody has to operate by the same rules for the system to work, in their view. But the mosaic, it would also mean that, that people on Medicare, 52 million people on Medicare, would suddenly find 275 million other people competing in that same space. And it really couldn't become Medicare for all. It would really have to become Medicaid for all because of the cost. Ch Chuck Blayhouse from the Mercatus Center did an analysis, really a conservative analysis, giving, giving the, the writers, the authors of this legislation, the benefit of the doubt that they could, in fact, cut prices in the, uh, pr to providers, to, health, to hospitals and to physicians by 40% in order to be able to make the numbers work and even still 
the cost would be $32 trillion in additional government costs over 10 years to pay for this. No one can see how that's possible because it would really, even doubling of all taxes that we currently pay, wouldn't pay for it. But I think the crucial thing here, and the thing really to understand in the context of this thrilling and exciting conference where I think the model should be, we're a man as hell and we're going to take it, not going to take it anymore. That's really exactly um, as Ashley was saying. I think the model here, we have a better idea. You have a better idea. You want to take care of doctor, your patients, and you want to do it with as little bureaucratic as no bureaucratic influence so that you can do what's best for your patients. Unfortunately, the more government is involved, the more they want to control how every dollar is spent. They want to make sure every CPT code, that's the problem that we have with, with allowing health savings account money to be able to, to be used for, um, for DPC care. Right now, it's not allowed, and that's, and there, even the legislation that has been written to try to fix this says, well, we can only allow DPC for certain CPT codes. They can only allow it under, with certain um, amounts that you can charge for your services. Why on earth should the government get involved in that? But whenever you get government involved in making legislative decisions, they can't help but want to control it. And how much does Washington know about how to take care of your patients? They don't know it, but they want to control it nonetheless because they control the money. And the only way that we're going to be able to really energize the health sector and energize the kind of creative decisions that you have here is by untying a lot of this regulatory um, red tape and these mountains of regulation that, that have really are suffocating the health sector and, and allow the market to work so that you can provide the kinds of care that your patients want but without the interference of all of these other rules and regulations. So we're working together you know, to try to get Congress to see that we need as light a regulatory hand as possible for the um, HSAs and HRAs to be used for direct primary care. But I will tell you it is very difficult. The reason that it's so difficult is that Washington has to jump through the hoops of the Congressional Budget Office with every piece of legislation that they consider and pass. And they have to figure how much is this going to cost the taxpayer. And in order to be able to not have the CBO go off completely off the rails, they put limits on what could be spent. What would the government's output be, or the outlay be, if you were to do X, Y, or Z? That's why it gets so difficult, and why it's so hard for Washington to solve these problems. One of the things that I have been working with, my colleagues in the policy community, a lot of others from the Brookings Institution, the American Enterprise Institute, a number of think tanks, right and left, primarily people who believe in markets, to try to figure out what are we going to do to help revive Obamacare and to allow that money to be able to spend more wisely so people have more choices. And we've come up with a plan called the, the, the Healthcare Choices Plan. It's sort of a bottom-up piece of legislation and, and proposal that comes from people looking at what's wrong, trying to figure out how do we solve this, and take the resources that are currently going to, to support ACA coverage, but to instead allow states and even localities to figure out how can we do a better job of serving those patients so they have more choices, they have more affordable coverage, and you're not driving healthy people out of the market. When we did our launch event in June at the Hoover Institution in Washington, one of the speakers was State Senator Bryce Reeves from Virginia. And he pulled out his phone and he said, you know, I just got a, an email from one of my constituents. And he said, I just got my bill for my health insurance premiums. 
He lives in Fredericksburg, Virginia, about 90 miles south of Washington. He has his own business. He says, I make a, a decent living. I can support my family. My bill for my health insurance is $4,000 a month. He said, how? He said, how am I, what am I supposed to do? He said, that's much more than my mortgage. I cannot keep a roof over the head of my family and protect them with health insurance. And that's the only plan offering coverage in his, in his city, in his county. So that's why we've got to solve this. Unfortunately, we're just not, I just don't believe we're going to go to a single payer system. I don't think the American people will, they, as much as we want things to change, they don't want it to change again with so much turmoil and so much confusion as they had after the AC, ACA passed. We live in a mosaic, and I think we just need to own that. That we have Medicare and we have Medicaid and we've got the ACA and we've got the VA, we've got the Indian Health Service, and we've got also a lot of these new options that are coming up. And direct primary care, I think, is really a centerpiece because it's the place where doctors and patients are in control of decisions and in control of really providing the kind of coordinated care, being able to provide access to specialists. And I think that the, the wraparound coverage is exactly what is needed, this, this whole package. And one of the things I'm taking away from this as a policy initiative, and I think there will be a lot of receptivity in this, is that we've got to legislatively open up the opportunity for health sharing ministries to be able to, new ones to come along, as well as being able to invite communities that they feel will work with their sharing ministries. There's no reason that we need to live under that current restriction. New legislation could be passed. So then I'll conclude here, maybe we can take a couple of questions with what's gonna happen on Tuesday. I have no idea what's gonna happen on Tuesday, nor does anybody else, but if you start to see the pollsters on Sunday, what's happened is that it's very likely the Republicans are gonna to continue to control the Senate, whether they pick up seats or not. There's so many races that are so close, it's hard to know. But in the House, there are 30 to 40 races that are just knife edge close. And which way they either one, if they go either way, really will determine who controls the House and what kind of environment we're going to be dealing with going forward. If you start to see the pollsters this weekend back off, New York Times is saying there's an 85% chance that Democrats will take the House. If you start to see them on Sunday hedging on that and saying, you know, a lot of these races are really tightening up. It's really hard to know then I think that there's a chance that you may wind up with the same, um, the same control, although with much narrower margins in the House of Representatives, and possibly larger margins in the Senate. There are 750 bills that have passed the House, this, this Congress, that are waiting for Senate action. So when you hear about gridlock, things can't get through the Senate because you've got a few senators, they've only got a 50, Republicans only have a 51 vote margin right now. They can't get anything passed if one or two senators isn't there to vote. And when Senator McCain was sick, they had really a basically a 50-50 Congress, a 50-50 Senate. So that's gonna help break loose what's, what the options, options are gonna be. Pre-existing conditions, absolutely are gonna be on the agenda. So will high drug costs, so will opioid treatment. Those will be things I think either way will be on the congressional agenda. But I will tell you that, that the people who really want to see this movement thrive are the people who believe in this mosaic and not in more government control. There are people in Washington who think the only reason the ACA didn't succeed is that we didn't give it enough control and we didn't give enough money to Washington. The reason it didn't succeed is because there is this vibrancy in our economy and particularly in our health sector and particularly in this room 
to create new options, to give people more opportunities, to think of new ways of solving problems, and for, for Mr. Rosen to get the other executives in this area together and, and force change. That is the kind of thing that happens. It's the kind of thing that, that is part of our, our, our system of civil society and working together to create problems at the lowest level possible because that's where we can talk to each other. And so I think that we're going to have a, a very interesting next couple of years. I hope you'll invite me back <laughs> to see where we are. But I, I do believe that there are people in Washington who want to see this movement not only succeed but thrive to let you all be the physicians that you were trained to be so that you can take care of your patients and get Washington out of your lives. So thank you all very much. So do we have a minute for how did I do? Time-wise, we have a few you minutes for questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we do have a few minutes. If you if you do have a couple questions, I'm just going to open up with with the first one. If you could yes, yes. sort of weigh in on where you think, regardless of, of what happens with the election, what do you think the future of the HSA bills for direct primary care looks like in a lame duck session? Mm, in a lame duck, um, I I think that actually, <laughs> this is a bit perverse. If Republicans lose the House, I think you're going to see a lot of health care bills go through because they're going to want to do as much as they can because they know that it may be years before they, before they have, have the opportunity to do this. It's difficult if it hasn't already gotten through the, through the, through the Senate. I think it would be very, very difficult, but, but they're, they do a lot of good things and a lot of bad things in these omnibus spending bills. Another one has to be done in December. This is our opportunity. But we need to make sure that the legislation doesn't create an opportunity for the regulators to drive a truck through what you're doing here in your free market mechanism. And we're going to, continue, we're going to work together. I know that you didn't see the actual legislative language until a day or two before. That's going to happen again. That's the way they do it. They don't want to let it sit out there for too long. So we're going to have to talk with the people that are doing this. Emily Murray's now left the Ways and Means Committee. But if there's a way to do it, we'll make it happen. But I think that if Republicans do hold the House, then we're going to have time for a more thoughtful conversation. As I said before, they do not want to go through this, ba this bashing again with, that they've gotten with, direct prime, with, uh, with uh, pre existing conditions. So they know they've got to do something. They don't want to go back to the voters in 2020, but it will be a bigger bill and it will be something that I think will be more, more substantive. And by the way, can I just say one thing? Okay, this pre existing condition thing makes me crazy <laughs> because. People are conflating an a, a insurance term. Can you buy a policy, an insurance policy, if you have a pre-existing condition under Obamacare? Yes. People hear it as they're going to lose their protection for their chronic illnesses. I had a friend on Medicare say, oh, what a terrible person I am because I'm provide, presenting alternatives to the ACA because she said, I'm going to lose my pre-existing condition protection. She's on Medicare. She's not going <laughs> to. But people think that. They think with their employer coverage, they're going to lose it. They're conflating chronic care and pre-existing conditions. So we've got to help make people not be so frightened. Do you want to take in a couple questions from the audience? Anybody? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Bruce there Cunningham you are. Great. from Minnesota. Thank you. It's hard to see. You, you talked about single payer, and certainly one side of the equation is going towards single payer. That's what the ACA was all designed to go to. No one on the national stage has talked about what doctors would get paid under that system. What? And we need to get that message out mm. that under that system, no physician's going to stay in the system. They're all going to go to what we're doing right now. Actually, the CBO has said that because they're going to basically use 40% payment cuts 
to all physicians and hospitals, and it will continue over time until basically everybody goes bankrupt. Well, There's no end to it. So look at uh, the, the study that Chuck Blayhouse, Charles Blayhouse, B-L-A-H-O-U-S, with a Mercatus, M-E-R-C-A-T-U-S, come see me afterwards and give me your card and I'll send you the link to it. But he had, in doing his modeling of the $32 trillion cost, he had to, to write down what does this mean as far as payment to the medical community. And it's the payments would have to bankrupt you for it to only cost $32 trillion over 10 years. Yes, so thank you, I get your point. Yes, sir. So my name is Dino Ramsey. Um, I'm a physician who uh, trained in Canada and moved to the States. Yeah, good. I have a master's in public health, but I'm a DPC physician, so I struggle with this ideological uh, divide, thank you, <laughs> uh, every day. Uh, and what I would like to hear is a very clear articulation, and I think it needs to be heard, which is why I'm asking this. What is the very clear articulation of how it is good for the social concerns that people have to move to a free market system because it sounds like the other side has a lock on that. Thank you. That's really a great question. So I look at the Medicaid expansion as a good example of how to think about that because Medicaid is our safety net program, right? When the ACA passed, it allowed able-bodied adult men, childless adults, to be part of Medicaid. What happens is this, and, and pay, the, pay the states more, actually, for enrolling this Medicaid expansion population. What's happening is that states are focusing more on them and getting them enrolled while they have waiting lists for people who have nowhere else to go for care and coverage. They don't have an employer, they don't have the option of an employer plan, as many people in the Medicaid expansion population do. And they also have to compete for physicians. I had a father write to me who said, I've got a daughter with significant number of, of chronic special needs. And he said, she, I need to get an appointment with a urologist for her. And he said, I used to, she's on Medicaid, he said, it used to take me six weeks calling around to get an appointment. He said, now it takes me six months. I can't get anyone to see her. So what I would tell them, is we are a compassionate country. We want to take care of people who don't have anywhere else to go for care. But if you put everybody in the same system, it's going to be survival of the fittest. And it's going to be even harder for the people who have nowhere else to go for care to be able to get the care and the coverage they need. So, so the free market and giving people options that they want so that this Fredericksburg uh, father can afford a policy for his family and not have to make a decision between paying his mortgage and paying for health insurance to give him affordable options so that this system works. So the people on the safety net programs, that it's a stronger safety net and you don't put so many people in it that it really collapses. Yes, sir. Good evening. My, my name is Oliver Braun. Uh, I, I have been uh, born and raised in Germany before I moved here at age 30. Um, and I, I would like to learn how come that pre-existing conditions are such a big factor in the United States? Because it isn't in Germany. I mean, everybody pays, basically the entire healthcare system works like the health share here. How come that the American healthcare system is so different that they're not willing to take care of the really sick? In mm -hmm. fact, there's, you know, they push them aside and say, you're expensive, mm -hmm. go and rot. So why is that? Actually, the, the Affordable Care Act, when it uh, was passed, set up a temporary high-risk pool. This was a place where people who had pre-existing conditions, chronic conditions, could go to get care at, while the ACA was getting up and running. About 250,000 people at, at any one uh, total enrolled in that plan. So. When you look at who are people who don't have the option of other colors, they're not eligible for Medicare, they're not eligible for Medicaid, they don't have employer coverage, they can't afford an individual policy, how do we take care of them? In the past, 
states actually had set up their own high-risk pools. And I've had people write to me saying that they actually got much better care and had many more options. One woman from Colorado, Janet, from her Colorado high-risk pool than she did from the ACA, where it was so controlled and so bureaucratized that she was basically not able to get the meds for her transplant, et cetera. And so giving people the option of, um, of having insurance and continuity of insurance so that they can buy a policy that they can afford, so they can be in a plan that works for them, DPC, so that they can have an HSA, so they can have employer coverage that may be portable through the health reimbursement arrangements. If people have insurance that they don't have to lose because of artificial external events, then you don't have to worry about, direct, about pre existing conditions because if you've got continuous coverage and the insurance companies under HIPAA are basically required to continue to cover you at the same premium rate without, within the range, even if you wind up with getting cancer or needing a liver transplant, it's the continuous coverage that's important. And that's why we need this mosaic, because we're just not a country that is going to put everybody under the same Medicare program. Medicare is already going bankrupt, and we can't afford it. We can't afford it um, now, and we certainly wouldn't be able to afford it when it puts all of you out of business, because the payment rates are so low. So we've got to, we've got to figure out how to do the mosaic, keep people continuously covered, and the only way we're gonna, we're gonna do that is to give them more options they can afford, and continue to provide subsidies for people who need help in purchasing coverage. We have time for one last question. Hi, uh, my name's Claude O'Ryan. I'm actually just joining the international group here talking about our experiences growing oh, up. I grew up in Northern Ireland, which is part of the UK, yeah. trained in the Republic of Ireland, two different socialized healthcare systems. Yeah. So I've lived and worked in socialized medicine and it's not perfect, in fact. Um, I think my experience, I'm now a practicing direct primary care doctor and my experience with my family and friends in Ireland is that they do not have to be afraid of be going bankrupt from their, for their medical care, mm -hmm. but they have to wait and suffer through needlessly through, uh, to wait for their surgeries, to wait for their health care. My 42-year-old uh, brother-in-law almost died because he had um, coronary artery disease and had to wait for four weeks to see the cardiologist, and he had three stent stents put in, having uh, daily chest pain walking up the stairs. Mm -hmm. So we were very lucky at that time. My, uh, my perspective now as working in the United States for about 15 years now is this is not about, uh, we've said this before today, this is not about coverage, this is about the pricing underneath the coverage and I think that that's, that's the most right. important thing for us that's to be right. working on is mm -hmm. the hospital pricing, the pharmaceutical pricing mm -hmm. because that's what is keeping all our um, costs up, our patients' costs up and that is definitely something that, that the NHS and the Republic of Ireland healthcare system has figured out is how to keep those prices down. Uh, they just haven't figured out how to provide um, care in a timely manner. So I think that is the most important thing from my perspective. That's Thank so you. right. I'm yeah. so right. I totally agree with you. It all comes down to cost. That always is the critical issue, people worried about, about going bankrupt, not being able to afford doctor's bills. And the problem we've got in this country is, is the incredible lack of transparency. So nobody has the vaguest idea how much anything costs. And if we had more transparency, we had more individual engagement in caring about whether something costs $3,000 or $30,000, and, and forcing patient the prices down like we do when the rest of the economy, well, we'd force that hospital to be a lot more efficient in figuring out how to do care and not just because of the third, fourth, and fifth party payment systems we have in this country, being able to spread to say, well, the patient does, is never going to know how much this costs because somebody else is paying the bill. We're all paying for it. And having, I think that's one of, one of the many reasons the DBC is so valuable. People know exactly how much they're spending on their primary care. 
and then being able to have umbrella coverage, having Sidera being able to negotiate bills and be able to um, to act on your behalf. There are a number of other uh, firms that are doing that as well. The crucial thing is that we have the environment for that to happen and for people to care. They do care. They want to take care of their families, they want it to be affordable, and they want to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. And we're only going to do that if the system works better, that's more transparency, more individual choice, and more individual responsibility so that people will listen to you and take care of yourself. I know the Physicians Foundation, in the survey you just did, one of the, one of the problems is whether or not people follow instructions, whether they get their meds and take them or whether they follow your recommendations. We've got to provide incentives in the system for that to happen. Washington can't do that. Only you all and the kinds of options and opportunities you're doing. So congratulations on what you're doing. Thank you, Dr. Gross, for everything that you're doing here with this fabulous organization. I'd love to see the energy and the growth. You're the only happy physicians I know, so more power <laughs> to you.